Laurie, might I invite you to field questions and comments? And let me start off with uh, one myself. Uh, I agree with much of your paper, but you didn't dwell overly on the non-proliferation treaty regime and the implied bargain in that, that the nuclear powers will move towards disarmament, while the non-nuclear powers will not uh, attempt to seriously arm themselves. And we've been through a period over the last 20 years where we have seen appreciable proliferation. And my concern is that if this continues for much longer, lots of countries are going to be thinking that perhaps nuclear weapons are good for our security and that we should do something about it. And that creates uh, a much more complex <coughs> problem of control. It's hard enough, as you have said, uh, to, tr to think about bringing the number of nuclear weapon states down from its existing level. But this has to be done against the background of increasing urgency. Uh, because one thing you didn't mention is the advent of the suicide bomber equipped with weapons of mass destruction, whether they be nuclear weapons or uh, more probably um, a radiological weapon. We have uh, had a number of close scares uh, in that area, and I know from talking to our friends in the Gang of Four, this they and lots of other Americans now see as the prime security threat to the United States. And I think this does lend uh, an air of urgency, uh, certainly to attempts to control proliferation and bring the problem under control, but also it could lend a sense of urgency to the people who want to use a nuclear weapon at the cost of their own lives for extracting revenge for hurts real or imagined that they or their religious groups or their societies have suffered. Yeah. Um I mean, clearly one of the advantages of, of making progress on strategic arms control, apart from that there just are simply too many of these weapons around, uh, is, um, is Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and showing that the great powers are starting to perform their part of the bargain again, which they have been seen not to have done. So that may help. But the big problems are outside of the NPT. And the, the, the states that we're worrying about are not, have either never joined or left. Um, or, or, or are denying that they're in, in violation. So uh, while this, it, the norm of non-proliferation is extremely important, we should try to uphold it, um, it only deals with part of the problem. Ditto, I mean, I, I didn't, for reasons of time, go into the suicide bomb, but I, it seems to me that is a, exactly the sort of problem that isn't captured by, by the big framework. Uh, it requires good intelligence, um, careful attention to facilities. Uh, it's certainly, uh, it's about the general trends in terrorism as well as about uh, particular nuclear opportunities. So of course it's something that, as with the other, all the other things I was mentioning, require urgent attention. That's no part of my argument is, is, that, is that one should be complacent about this. Far from it, I think we should take these things more, uh, more carefully. So the, my argument is only that it requires rather particular and detailed attention and very specific measures rather than, rather than a grand plan. I don't think the grand plan will help you with a, nuclear, with, uh, a suicide bomber. So that, that would be my, my point. Uh, Rory Metcalf from the Moe Institute. And thanks, Professor Friedman, for a, a very um, thought-provoking uh, le lecture. I think there'll be a lot to... Uh, explore that later and the Institute will be publishing the lecture at, uh, at a later date so on our website so I encourage everyone here to, um, to, to look into that. My, my question um, was to take up a point you made uh, about the, I think the, the lack of intellectual ferment uh, on some of these issues at, at the moment and uh, of course those of us in, um, in think tanks that are working on these issues won't take that personally. Um, my, my question is where would you look uh, if you were to be seeking fresh thinking, especially on the, the issues you touched on towards the end of your lecture, um, pointing out that it's the, the risk of use of nuclear weapons among the countries with, with relatively small arsenals in, in, in quite unstable regional situations uh, that is maybe the primary problem? Uh, would you, can you expect to look to those countries to be providing uh, the ideas for the way forward? 
It's an extremely fair question. Um, I, I, went, I went to a meeting of uh, Pugwash um, in association, which some of you may know, uh, was set up in the, almost the last acts of, of Albert Einstein and Sir Bertrand Russell in the mid-50s to promote sort of rational discourse on disarmament and, and so on. And it was like it was like going back in a time warp. I mean, the 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 the, the, the they were chat. They, they, you know, they, they were they want to attack the idea of just deterrence. Well, you know, we've all moved on from those sorts of debates. Um, and so, what was worrying me, and I partly reflected th th that comment, was was that everybody's going to be uh, charging at uh, the wrong targets um, because of the great power. Issues don't seem to me to be as pressing as before. Um, the, the real need is to focus on, on on the meaning of small nuclear arsenals. I suppose that's really where where I think uh, it, it's interesting. And I do think we need to engage scholars from the relevant countries and the relevant regions in that, because when you do, as I'm sure you're aware, you get a very different take on, on what's involved. And you know, going back to the question on Iran, listening to an Israeli a very serious Israeli academic, talk about Ahmadinejad's personal philosophy um, and, the, and the 13th Imam and all this, and how this can feed into a view of nuclear use and extreme violence. You know, you sort of, well, you know, maybe the, 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 this sounds a bit far-fetched, but it is a different take. So my, my, I think it's, it's the logic of what I'm saying is, is yes, I think we, we have to engage um, with the people and with the with, with the countries where um, these these problems are most pressing, when when the problem was a great power problem, it was fair enough that the big debates took place amongst the big nuclear powers, and you know they've still got, obviously got a lot to contribute, um, and they've got something to contribute, as with say India and Pakistan in terms of you know how if you are going to have nuclear stockpiles, how do you hold them safely? What are useful forms of of, of crisis management? Um, do you really understand how deterrence works? Have you thought it through? I mean, so I think there is a role to be played in that way. But I think it is exactly the linkage between um, with, with, the, with the, the, the potential proliferators and the potential victims that, that, that may provide some new insight. Uh, Chris Skinner, and uh, I'm not a member of any specific organization. Um, I, I'm just a humble engineer, and we work in probabilities and percentages rather than absolutes. And I must say, I'm pessimistic about the possibility that there will never, ever, at any time in the future, be the use of a nuclear device. And what engineers do is try to minimise the probability and delay that occurring as long as possible. And I'm, my question is, would you see there is some merit in educating everybody in the world about the real consequences of that unlikely event sometime in the distant future? For example, I felt visiting the uh, museum at the Peace Park in Hiroshima was immensely educational and, uh, and very moving. And I'm sure other things could be done. For example, the Rand Corporation, in the time of mutually assured destruction, did an awful lot of modelling, which was highly classified. Had the same sort of modelling been published, I'm sure uh, many people would have uh, gained a, a very real uh, abhorrence for what might have happened. So the question yeah. is, should we educate everybody on the consequences? Yeah, probably did quite well to educate people on risk and probability, where they uh, often, I mean, it, you know, the famous comment about, was it C.P. Snow in 1960 or something, that was a statistical certainty that nuclear weapons would be used by the end of the decade. Um, and I suppose people have got blase because they haven't been used. Um, and I, you know, I tend to, to share your view, it just seems improbable that, that you can go on indefinitely without something awful happening. Um, whether the, the educational part is interesting. People, I mean, there's been plenty of television programs and uh, demonstrations of, of, of what would happen if a nuclear weapon drops on, uh, drops from the middle of Sydney or, or, or in the middle of London or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, I'm sure. Gareth Evans' report will, will, will contain similar sorts of, of demonstrations. And it's always grim and grisly. Uh, it, it, I, I just find it astonishing that people can get very... Oh, I don't find it astonishing that people can get worried about 
uh, sort of a carbon summer, if you like. Uh, you know, it, it, there's lots to worry about with, with, with climate change. But this could happen immediately. I mean, it doesn't take large amounts of uh, uh, industrial processes churning out stuff over decades. It's the capabilities there now. So I, thought, I always find it a bit strange that uh, people can get far more worked out about civil nuclear energy, which is not supposed to go off, than nuclear, you know, military nuclear energy, which is and is there. So yes, there, there it is. Um, I, I'm sure that there's more, there's more to be done, but I don't actually think the problem is that people don't know what nuclear weapons can do. I think they, they, they generally, do, but it's hard to imagine it. I think, and maybe there the, the filmmakers and so on can do a lot. In the early 80s, there was a lot done. There were a lot of quite good films that, that did show, uh, you know, the day after. But there was always, you know, thankfully a great problem with these movies is that they can never explain why actually the nuclear weapons had been used in the first place. And that might be even, you know, hopefully be harder now. Uh, Tom Morton, ABC Radio National. Um, so Lawrence, I think I'm, I hope I'm summarising what you said in the earlier part of your talk correctly when you said that it was primarily, at least during the Cold War, the strategic and political environment which drove the, the tenor, if you like, of disarmament talks rather than the other way around. But I just wondered if you wanted to try and apply that insight and what the beginnings of a new theory might be to uh, the case of Iran and Israel, because we've had statements fairly recently by a, a senior former Israeli diplomat saying that under no circumstances would Israel tolerate the possibility of Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon uh, and that Israel would take preventative measures, presumably non-nuclear strikes against Iran to prevent that. Um, we have, on the other hand, the profoundly destabilising fact of the existence of uh, Israeli nuclear weapons outside of the NPT. Um, and you could argue then that, in fact, the mere, the mere possibility that Iran might acquire nuclear weapons is something that's driving increased tension, in, increased possibility of conflict in the Middle East. How would your... How would the beginnings of a new theory seek to deal with that? What might be some practical steps that could be taken? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we probably need practical steps more than a theory. Um, Israel, my, my view is that it, it, Israel is a bit caught by this, um, and that if it was able to do something about Iran's nuclear capability, it would have done it and not talked about it. Uh, like it dealt with Syria, and like it dealt with Iraq in, in 1981. And I think it feels frustrated and a bit uncertain about what it can do. Uh, and it's undoubtedly worried. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about the worry. Another favorite Israeli statement is uh, Israel won't be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East, but it won't be the second either. Uh, uh, and they have a capability which they've handled very carefully. They've never been overt. They've never... They don't. They make sure people are reminded of it one way or the other every ten years, but they don't do much uh, to brag about it. And um, one of the potential consequences of an Iranian nuclear capability that Israel hasn't stopped is Israel becoming more overt in its own nuclear deterrent. Um, and then you will start to see you know, all these questions about what sort of threats and and so on is necessary, and that will be a destabilizing thing. I mean, everybody knows Israel's got a nuclear capability, and all. And Arab countries have all made their adjustments accordingly. But, it, but everybody would then have to respond, including the United States. And so that would create a, a crisis all of its own. Um, and so I think the, pra the practical steps are, can you stop Iran before it gets to that stage? And the real difficulty, I think, is you can, probably. But what you probably can't do is stop Iran now enriching sufficient uranium. So it'll always have the capability to have fissionable material, but it won't actually, if you have a deal, manufacture weapons. Um, and whether people think that's a stable situation or not, I'm not sure. But I think that, that that's probably where we'll get to. And the question then I think will be, you know, which is partly the, the logic of my argument, put this in a broader political context. Is it, you, know, you might have a new Iranian president. You, the, the Iranian economy is in a terrible state. They're suffering from the price of oil and 25% inflation and um, hundreds of thousands out of work and so on. So let's, let's have a wider political look at this. If you just look at the weapons in isolation, you're probably going to be very dissatisfied. But maybe there's a, there's a broader political deal 
that can be done. And I guess that's the way the, the Obama administration is looking at it. I can hear. <laughs> um, uh, firstly, uh, thank you and your colleagues for allowing me to live for the last 60 years uh, by maintaining the, uh, the peace and so on. Um, uh, but if I ask you uh, to be uh, uh, in intellectually independent for a second and, and you're being asked by the Rudd government um, you know, for your advice, um, about uh, the, the clear failure. I mean, you've had 60 years to get rid of all nuclear weapons, and uh, there must come a point where this really has got to be regarded as a failed experiment. At, at what point would you think it would be sensible for Australia to actually arm with nuclear weapons? Gosh, that's a, <laughs> a loaded question. Um, I, w um, I think you can put off that fateful day for the moment. Um, uh, you know, it has, it, it, the, I'm skeptical, as you may have gathered, about wholesale nuclear disarmament. But you, you know, you could argue it's never been tried. Um, the, the sense of failure came in after 10 years um, because there was you know, uh, actually, in some ways, a plausible plan developed in the early 40s. Um, sorry, in the, in, the, in the second half of the 40s, uh, which, because of the Cold War, never was implemented. Um, and then by the mid 50s. They looked like they were here to stay, and nobody. Could, and then gradually thought, well, maybe they're doing some good, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll hold on to them. Um, and I think the the clamour for disarmament wasn't really there. The reason why I think the clamour now may get somewhere, as far as the major powers are concerned, is, is that there aren't really the um, despite the, 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 the spat between with with, with, uh, with Russia over Georgia and so on. There isn't really um, the, the sort of sense of, of, of imminent conflict or a danger of conflict that would justify holding on to these weapons simply for great power deterrent purposes. So for that reason, I think it is a new situation, and I wouldn't therefore say it had failed. I wouldn't presume to tell Australians what to do. Uh, the, you've had too many Brits doing that in the past. Um, I would, uh, all I would say is you, in, ask, in answering that question, you'd have in, what is, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? You know, what is a security threat to Australia that would justify moving in that direction? Um, and is it a threat that we can deal with by that means? Uh, and that's all I'm going to say on this question. <laughs> Final speaker in the back row. Uh, Dennis O'Neill, New Power Resources Limited. The issue of nuclear energy, I think, is, is and, and security of nuclear energy uh, or sorry, security of energy, but dr driven through provision of nuclear energy, uh, has really emerged very strongly in the last couple of years. And I, I feel the issue of nuclear proliferation in its current view can't be adequately addressed unless we move from the strategic security question, I think that Richard Pronofsky raised in his question, uh, and which, which was implicit in the NPT, to a broader question of also adding energy security, because countries in moving toward nuclear uh, energy, as many are in the Northern Hemisphere, clearly are looking or may look to acquire the technologies, indeed as Iran seems to be doing, which also bring uh, with them the capacity to move to nuclear weapons. So that in looking at nuclear disarmament, do we not also need a renewed push to look at how Article 6 can be implemented, but in a way that curbs the acquisition of these other technologies? And I point to the initiatives that the US has taken with the United Arab Emirates, which I feel uh, point in a very positive way toward a way of delivering on Article 6 while not resulting in the outcomes that uh, Iran seems to be heading toward. Do you have a view on this? Well, I, I think I agree. I, the, the, um, clearly, there is a push to civil nuclear energy. And I don't think that 
I mean, it may be not back because of the collapse of the oil price, but I'm sure it'll come back again. And Russia's behaviour and so on has um, has made people more aware of issues of energy independence and security, irrespective of the economics uh, of the oil price and so on. So yes, I think so. Point one: there's going to be more civil nuclear energy around. Um, point two: it can be developed without using the same technologies necessary for military use. I mean, that's why Iran's program uh, has to be treated with skepticism, because for what it's trying to do, you don't need the enrichment at the level it's doing it. So you know there's something fishy going on precisely for that reason. So there are ways of, of, of having civil nuclear uh, energy without carrying a risk that it will be used for military purposes, but that requires uh, uh, safeguards and where the mechanisms are there. It's not a problem of developing new safeguards. It's known what has to be done. Um, and I think the, I've um, only just become aware of this Australian UAE agreement, but, but, but there are other models as well. Uh, sorry, the American UAE agreement. Um, the, 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 I just insist on very strong safeguards. Yes, you can have it, but, but, but um, this is going to be very controlled. Um, I mean, the, the other side of it is, is the simple question of security. Uh, I mean, one of the scarier aspects of the Russian, of the recent Russian-Ukraine pipeline crisis was, was it Bulgaria, who suddenly announced they were going to sort of bring out of, uh, uh, bring into use again some pretty decrepit old uh, nuclear power stations. It was deeply scary um, for everybody, not least the Bulgarians. Um, and, you know, Chernobyl and Three Mile Island are still... You know the most recent experiences of of, of, um, of nuclear radiation being unleashed, and, and we've got a. Uh, but also, if we're worried about terrorism and so on, safeguards of that. So, you know, just having modern systems seems to me to be important. So, um, and I think this is just something to be borne in mind when we're looking at, at the future of civil nuclear energy. Is if we are going to go in that direction, it's far better that we go in a controlled direction with modern safer systems than countries find their energy needs uh, not being met by elsewhere and rely on systems that are old and decrepit and dangerous. <clears throat> Laurie, thank you very much indeed. Uh, your talk rep represents uh, the output of over 30 years of, of research, debate, constant exchange of ideas, uh, and we're very grateful that you've come and put these before us. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join with me in showing our appreciation. <laughs>